Why do you want to be a lobby boy? Who wouldn't? At the Grand Budapest, sir. The Grand Budapest Hotel is so infused with intention, its eccentric depth is bursting out of the screen. But what's most fascinating to me is how it serves as a charming avenue to escapism, despite being immensely dark in many ways. Wes Anderson cleverly takes advantage of every tool in his toolbox, masterfully manipulating color, cinematography, production design, and dialogue to craft an inception of storytelling. And I don't mean this inception, I'm talking about this inception. Let me explain. The author starts the film with his narration, explaining his time at the Grand Budapest Hotel, and how he came to know the story of Zero Mustafa. When that story begins to unfold, the narration is taken over by Zero himself, who walks us through his rags to riches journey. And by this, the Grand Budapest Hotel is a story within a story, and explores how the passage of time, and how the sharers of stories, impacts how they are portrayed. Well, it begins as it must with our mutual friend's predecessor, the beloved original concierge of the Grand Budapest. A lot of people consider Wes Anderson's filmmaking to be pretentious. It's incredibly stylized and completely unnatural with how it utilizes color and framing. It's visually stunning in a way that screams deliberate. And that's exactly it. Every choice he makes is very purposeful, and the pretentious look of the Grand Budapest Hotel is shaped to emphasize the character's eagerness to be part of a refined society, and reflect both narrator's pure passion for the tales they tell. If we take a look at the Grand Budapest Hotel's former concierge, Monsieur Gustave, we'll quickly be able to notice how self-confident he is. Despite not having much money, he assumes great leadership over the hotel staff, who respect his commands. Gustave speaks with rich eloquence and sophistication. Even his cursing comes in alliteration. I've never seen her like that before. No, sir. She was shaking like a shitting dog. Truly. It's the wealthy company he keeps and his deep adoration for the lavish hotel that have likely led to his adoption of this way of speaking. And with it has come assimilation into the upper class society. Gustave's mind is seemingly flooded with poetic aside. Rudeness is merely the expression of fear. People fear they won't get what they want. The most dreadful and unattractive person only needs to be loved, and they will open up like a flower. In which he integrates at arguably inappropriate and random moments. But despite his verbose speech, there is a distinction between himself and the affluent community he emulates. For when his poetry is at rest, he allows himself to speak with vulgar language. Indeed, that's what we provide in our own modest humble, insignificant. Yeah, oh, fuck it. Gustave's posh demeanor is no more than a persona that he himself has become lost in, due to his subconscious wish to be part of the polished aspects of society he spends every day around. When you have so little for yourself, such luxuries are bound to become part of your fantasies. It's the reason why Gustave is so worried about how he smells. Even after escaping prison, he's more upset at Zero for not having his cologne than having a proper disguise. Perfume is the ultimate luxury. It won't even make him look rich, just smell it. This ridiculous and insensible concern elucidates how fruitless his attempt to climb to bourgeoisie status is. And this is not all to say that his internal quest for aristocracy takes away from his kindness. Gustave grew to truly care for Zero, but ultimately, the Grand Budapest Hotel uses Gustave's character to demonstrate how we may wish to exude civility in an uncivilized world, but we cannot escape who we are and the unfair ways the world works. Even the lens in which we view this story is misleading. Unintentionally by Zero, but very intentionally by Wes Anderson. It quickly becomes evident that Zero's telling of his and Gustave's story is a glamorized version of the real events. Color plays a tremendous role in how Anderson shows that. In the opening scene of the film, the colors are pretty dull and very naturalistic. This is to illustrate that we are in modern times and in reality. This is the world of truth. The aspect ratio of the scene is also 1.85 to 1, the conventional aspect ratio of the modern era. But when we cut to the story of the author, the colors become more vibrant and the aspect ratio adjusts to 2.35 to 1 the standard of the 1960s. 
Then the movie shows us the conversation between the author and Zero, and we're brought into Zero's story, where the aspect ratio shifts again to 1.37 to 1, the sizing conventional of the 1930s, and the colors become even more saturated and further from reality. Through this use of cinematography and color, we're transported into another world, fully immersed in the nostalgia that the film creates. And once again, here's the thing about nostalgia. It filters our perspective. Zero looks back at his time working at the Grand Budapest Hotel and being friends with Gustav very positively. Gustav and Zero grew to form a brotherly bond, but the greatest difference between them was in how Gustav was subconsciously motivated by his adoration for upper-class society, whereas Zero's concern was always just for those he cared for and who cared for him. For my dearest, darling, treasured, cherished Agatha, whom I worship, with respect, adoration, admiration, kisses, gratitude, best wishes, and love, from Z to A. Like Gustav and Agatha. It's the reason he's still attached to the Grand Budapest Hotel, even though it's only lost him money. It connects him to Agatha. The hotel I keep for Agatha. We were happy here. For a little while. And so, Zero's love for his time at the hotel has caused him to look back at that period in his life as more glorious than it was. It was riddled by sadness and struggle. Yet, we see how he views it with such fantastical energy. To complement this warped perspective of the past, Anderson dives deeper into cinematography. The director is known for his use of symmetry. But what role does it play in the narrative and deeper meaning of the film? Anderson's tactfully centered framing has attracted criticism for detracting from the scene's emotionality. We're focused on how the shot is composed rather than getting engulfed in the emotional beat. And yes, his cinematic style would likely not work as effectively for a straight drama, but being a comedy drama veiled with satire and tragedy, it perfectly flatters what Anderson is trying to show about Zero's frame of mind. Symmetry delivers a tone of cleanliness and perfection. It demonstrates a world that is unattainable, just as the worlds of aristocracy or peace that Gustav and Zero respectively desired were so unattainable that they only existed in their imaginations. This coupled with the frequent use of wide shots, all giving the film and hotel a look of regality, luxuriousness, and grandeur, beautifully bring us into the inaccurate universe Zero has living inside of his head. This world of fantasy is brought to a screeching halt at the end. Just as the audience is settling into its happy ending, Zero abruptly explains Gustav's sudden and unexpected death, and we are then ejected from one layer of the story. What happened in the end? In the end, they shot him. So it all went to me. The layer of beautiful tragedy we were deepest in during the film. And we're brought back to the perspective of the author. After dinner, we went to collect the keys to our rooms, but Monsieur Jean had abandoned his post. I expect he's forgotten all about us. Then says one of the most notable lines of the entire film. To be frank, I think his world had vanished long before he ever entered it. But I will say, he certainly sustained the illusion with a marvelous grace. Here, he's talking about Gustave's perspective of the refined society he wished to be a part of. Gustave greatly idealized the finer things in life and dreamed of a world where luxury meant decency. You see, there are still faint glimmers of civilization left in this barbaric slaughterhouse that was once known as humanity. However, as Zero explains, that world was long gone. And that's if it ever even existed. And yet, Gustav's hopeless dream carried that fantasy until death. There are still faint glimmers of civilization left in this barbaric slaughterhouse that was once known as humanity. <laughs> he was one of them. By Zero acknowledging this fact, he is for the first time recognizing that the picture he paints of his past is a romanticized version of it. The characters of the Grand Budapest Hotel merely try to retreat into glimmers of civilization amidst the destructive and tyrannical world. This brings me back to the very beginning of the film, a scene so easy to forget during the extravagant sequences endured for over an hour and a half. The author's first line of dialogue, directed towards us, the audience. It is an extremely common mistake 
People think the writer's imagination is always at work, that he's constantly inventing an endless supply of incidents and episodes, that he simply dreams up his stories out of thin air. In point of fact, the opposite is true. Once the public knows you're a writer, they bring the characters and events to you. The Grand Budapest Hotel is once again a story within a story. It's verification that vivid thoughts, dreams, and memories cannot help but be shared. This is why Zero was so eager to share his past. Much in life is a retelling of someone else's story, which gets watered down and then changed throughout time or whatever subconscious feelings lie around the situation. In this case, the grandeur of the story and hotel is slightly muted by the retelling of the author, but at the same time, the vibrancy and excellency of Zero's perspective was a lament for the life, society, and the world he wished was true. When we truly listen and follow our curiosity's instincts, we can be brought into the craziest and most magical of worlds. Worlds which hide their truths in the storyteller's subjective perspective. Before I leave you, I must give a sincere apology for how pretentiously explained this video was. I think I may have been subconsciously influenced by the prose of Gustave.